So thank you very much, Alex, for joining today. Um, so we are very lucky to have uh, Alex with him from uh, Landbay joining us. Landbay is a big intermediary a mortgage lender, uh, and we're very uh, grateful for your time, Alex. I know you're very busy. Um, just before we get started, just obviously want to be clear, today is a, uh, a general kind of purpose chat and for information purposes. So none of the information that we discussed today should be relied upon from advice. Uh, and of course, uh, Landbay and uh, Alex, who could self as well, are not providing any advice in this session. Uh, we're just talking around some of the things to be considered around uh, buy to lets. And uh, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I guess just moving on then to the kind of next subject just to consider, um, which was, um, I guess, just getting back to the basics with buy to lets, because um, there's so much, um, you know, as we know, you know, criteria, um, things need to be considered, affordability, stress tests, all these kind of things. Um, what would you say at the moment are the kind of the main things that buy to let investors need to be considering in, in the current market? People need to look at, first of all, is engage with the right audience. You know, you can't, go into buy to lets and do everything yourself you know you need to lean on various people who are professionals in their sector um there's very few people that i would say are actually a kind of true jack of all trades and a master of all you know you need to have a good broker you need to have a good property tax specialist you need to have a good um, solicitor so your power team needs to be there that then extends into your build team if you if you're doing buy refurbish refinance or buy to convert to hmo or um, commercial to residential conversions etc but generally your immediate power team that you need to have early doors consists of people like yourself uh, good mortgage brokers good accountants um, good solicitors so starting with with, with those is, is very very key um, when it comes to looking at the actual deal itself, um, yes, there is a strong argument to say buy in an area where you know, uh, for example, buy locally, because you will generally know the market, you will know what streets are, are good, what streets are not so good, what areas uh, typically grow in value and what is quite uh, is rather static. However, you need to be buying with your head and not your heart. So yeah. if you see a property that looks wonderful that you want to live in yourself, quite often that may not be a good buy to let investment um, you need to be looking at how much do i need to pay for this property what deposit do i need what cash do i require to upgrade refurbish make this a good investment and what is my return on that investment going to be not i want to buy this wonderful five bed detached in a prime location because that'll be wonderful for me to live in myself or my, i can see my friends or family living there it's important that you remember buy to lets it is a business you know you are a commercial uh, purchaser not somewhere you're not buying something to to move into yourself so if the numbers don't stack um, you need to recognize quite quickly to to effectively shop again and, and go looking for something else um, quite often i do see people um make inquiries or look at purchasing properties that when you tear it apart and you look at the numbers, um, it makes no sense at all um, to invest in that property. More so at the moment, Paul, with rates being a little higher than they were during perhaps 2021 and, and, and previous, when you, when you have interest rates in the high fours, the low fives, even sometimes the early sixes, yield is going to be um, a big consideration probably now more than certainly ever in the last 10 years that I've been in mortgage lending um, so buying uh, with your head um, and not your heart is uh, is definitely a key consideration uh, it's critically important to extend that into carrying out thorough due diligence and not just looking at what the agency particulars are saying because every agent is going to say it's a wonderful property in great location perhaps it requires light modernization or a light refurb and when you actually go and view the property you realize that it's riddled with damp it's not in a particularly great location you know you have to realize that the agents are trying to sell they are acting usually on behalf of the vendor not the buyer yeah. so you have to carry and i'm sure you know what i mean you've seen this i'm sure on the receiving end as a broker and perhaps the buyer yourself the, the, the buyer needs to make sure they're carrying out thorough due diligence. And that would be using tools such as Rightmove, using tools such as Zoopla, mm. have a look at 
sales prices in that area, have a look at what they are actually selling for, not just what they are listed for. Um, using those tools to check um, let let agreed statistics. So again, if you're looking at investing in a certain area, have a look on. Uh, I'll pick right move just because it's the probably the most universally known one. You know, you pick right move, have a look at let agreed, and are there loads of let agreeds in that area, giving you an indication it's probably a prime area to invest. Similarly, you could use open rent or spare room to show you individual room demand if you're looking to invest in HMOs. That will give you an idea of what the um, tenants are desiring. Do they want bills all included? Do they want en suite? Do they want you know certain particulars within that um, within that room? And making sure if you're buying to convert, you are listening to what the consumer ultimately wants and meeting that meeting that need. Um, within your due diligence, you need to be using things like Google Maps and. Again, if you're buying in an area you do not live yourself, um, it's always best to go and visit that property, isn't it? You know, you, you yeah. don't necessarily want to be buying blind and just going off what the agent is telling you. You really need to be living and breathing even just for a day that area and scouting the area to make sure you're familiar with it. If the property is great, but it's directly next door to a fish and chip shop, individuals need to be aware that that's going to have implications on desire from the tenant desire in the event that you try and sell that property but okay. also talking mortgages getting mortgages as you know paul on a property that shares a party wall with a fish and chip shop or a chinese or a takeaway or a pub or a petrol station is notoriously difficult um it's not mm. impossible but it just makes the lender options um you know reduced yeah definitely uh and you're absolutely right it is it is it putting your, yourself in the, in the shoes of the person who's going to be renting the property um, and actually does it appeal, is it appealing? Um, and I mean, I guess if you like chips and your next to fish and chip shops, that's quite convenient probably. Uh, and, you know, we all like fish and chips, but um, you don't necessarily want to live right next to one. Um, and, uh, and the other um, shops and stuff that you've mentioned there, um, you, you're absolutely right around the, you know, when you're looking for a property, it shouldn't be, uh, I like it, therefore, I would rent it, so why would no one else? It's you're not renting it though, are you? It's someone else renting it, and therefore, who is your customer ultimately? You know, look at it like that. Who's your consumer? Who's your client? Uh, and where are they coming from? And what are they looking for? Uh, and if you buy a property that you like, but no one in the local area is looking for that, it's just not going to rent out, or it's going to rent out at below market. Um, so you're absolutely right. There's there's a huge amount of due diligence you can do, um, and especially when it comes to all the the online tools, like you've mentioned there, there are so many of them. Uh, so you're, you've got all the information available. Um, as you say, visiting the area is key as well. Um, and then I guess then, uh, there's some basics you can do around, you know, the tenant that you take on and we can maybe cover that later on. But, uh, um, when it comes to the, I guess the structure of, of buying a place nowadays, um, cause we mentioned, uh, in an earlier video around kind of buying, whether it's in your personal name or a limited company, um, where does Landbase sit within that scope at the minute? And I guess what's your thoughts on buying in your personal name or buying a property within a limited company structure? Well, I think there's lots of considerations to that, um, Paul, where you can't sit down the pub with your friend who wants to be a buy to landlord and the friend says to you, what do you do? And that is not necessarily right for that person. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because if you have an individual who is, you know, very successful, they've got a, a great job that they're earning super high income and they want to buy multiple buy to lets, um, they may receive advice from their tax advisor to say, based on your plans, your objectives, where you currently sit on your wealth and your income, it makes sense for you to build your empire using a limited company vehicle rather than acquire them in your personal name. However, his friend, who also wants to become a landlord, um, is on lower income. Um, perhaps he also has a partner who has low income or no income, and they're only really planning on buying one or two properties, therefore potentially still remaining in the lower rate tax category. It may be the exact wrong thing for them to buy their buy to lets in a limited company name, because remember, when the limited company receives the income, it still needs to draw it out. Um, mm. So you always need to consider everything, which kind of goes back to my earlier point that 
having the correct team around you is absolutely critical. But w we are seeing statistically a fairly significant rise in the number of purchases that are in a limited company name. Yeah. As you alluded to earlier, Section 24 tax uh, implications that were first introduced, I think 2015 now, they were introduced and, yeah. and they were brought in on a phase basis around 2017. They are now in full effect. They are hurting some landlords more than others. Um, but everyone is, you know, is being impacted by that. That is uh, increasing the, the number of limited companies that we're seeing. Last year, in 2023, there were 50,000 SPVs, so companies set up specifically to hold rental property, which broke records. That was the most yeah. um, that have ever been created in 2023, where new buy to let transactions were down on the previous year um, as a result of economical factors, interest rate rises, people sitting on their hands, and a few other things. So when the market was down a little, um, records were broken. So what that's telling us is that's where the market is going. And I anticipate there'll be more lenders join that pool of options this year and, and, and certainly next year because they are realizing um, and certainly recognizing that is the direction that a number of people are, are going. Most of our clients tend to be limited company. Um, we can lend to private individuals. You know, the price is the same. We don't load the rate. Um, for an SPV versus a private individual. Although it's fairly normal in mortgage lending, as you'll know, um, rates will typically be a little more expensive for limited company for the wider piece, not just specific to land bay. And solicitor and legal costs are usually a consideration um, and normally more expensive in a limited company name. So, you know, back to my point of you need to have a good power team around you. You need to have a good broker who consults early gives you your options. You need to have a good um, property specific tax advisor that can sit down and go through your entire profile, your objectives, your demands and needs um, before you take the leap and just think, you know, I want to buy a buy to let. It's trendy to do it in a company. Thus, I will set up an SPV and acquire it that way. You need, you need to get it right first time, critically important. No, I, I I champion that absolutely, and, and you're right. You shouldn't do what's trendy, and you shouldn't uh, you, you say about your 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 friend down the pub. I mean, the amount of conversations I've had over the years where the friend down the pub conversation I've had to unpick um, because uh, you know obviously your friends, you know, I'm sure it's trying to be helpful, but um, you know when it comes to your individual finances and your taxes and all those types of things, I mean they are individual to you. Um, and if you do it right, you'll benefit. If you do it wrong, you won't. And either way, your friend down the pub isn't impacted either way. You've got to deal with it. So you've really got to, like you say, have that dream team around you. Uh, and I think you, you're bang on around having a, a really good um, broker um, who's got access to a comprehensive range of lenders across the market. Um, and then a, a solicitor who's um, you know, quick and efficient and also experienced in you know, limited companies if you do go down that route. Um, and then an accountant, um, and specifically one who's got experience with property taxes in, and property management and that type of thing, not just a, a bookkeeper, but someone who's got that more wider knowledge. And if you've got that team of people around you, um, and then you're applying all the, 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 the knowledge and the due diligence, like you mentioned, around all the different sites, um, there's a very good chance you're going to come out the other end of that with you know the correct product, uh, the correct legals done the correct uh, structure from an ownership point of view, and more importantly, the correct property. Um, and like you say, it's a business, and therefore you should uh, hopefully be investing in a good property, a good business in that sense, and it's going to do you well. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you've, you've got to remember that knowledge is power, but a little knowledge is very dangerous. If yeah. you spend a, a few hours on Google um, trying to find information out that you take as 100% accurate and universal, and you therefore make the decision based on a little bit of knowledge that you've obtained um, and you make the wrong decision, um, that's on you. You know, for example, if you do some basic research and don't really think about your options and you go and purchase a couple of properties in your personal name and in the future years realize that was probably the wrong thing to do. And now you need to look at how do you change those properties from your personal name into a limited company that you that you probably should have done earlier, um, depending on your objectives at that time? That's usually a taxable event. Um, yeah. And moving those properties from your personal name to limited company could be 
prohibitive based on on costs to do that. So uh, a little knowledge, uh, yes, can be good uh, as long as you're very cautious and, and careful with that. But, um, you know, you need to make sure you start by investing in yourself and, um, you know, and really seeking the correct education. And a lot of that is speaking to the right people at the right time um, and making a proper informed decision and not just, you know, paying a thousand pounds for a get rich quick course thinking you know absolutely everything there is to know about buy to let and investing and you know running and doing it um there might be great courses out there that teach you everything um but you just need to make sure um you know you are truly educated correctly and you're leaning on the right support circle before you you know take the leap and make the make the choices no, I absolutely agree with that. And it just comes back to that, doesn't it? It's, it's just seek advice, get professional advice and guidance at the time. Um, sure, if you see stuff online, that's great. And, you know, even now this video, you know, it's informative, it's giving you ideas, but then you take that thought to then a professional uh, and get that guidance and that support. Uh, and that way you're protected, especially in the mortgage world, you're obviously regulated. So you're um, you're going to get that protection from what that regulation offers and the same from you know the accountant and the solicitors as well. So, yeah, very important um, to get that advice and, and to do it properly. Absolutely. Um, when it comes to, I guess, if we're just looking, because we're talking very heavily on buy to lets uh, today and, and, and uh, not everyone has a buy to let. People, people do even know what a buy to let is. Um, what would you say are the main um, differences when it comes to when you're comparing a buy to let mortgage to a residential mortgage for maybe someone looking to pursue, you know, who's got a mortgage at the minute is looking to do a buy to let, maybe doesn't realize there's a difference in terms of how those are structured and how you go about applying for one? Yeah, sure. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, um, a mortgage is a mortgage. However, a residential mortgage is a mortgage that you have on a house typically that you live in, either as your primary residence or a second holiday home or something like that. A buy to let loan is a property that you are buying to let, hence the name buy to let. Um, so for that reason, they are seen more as a commercial loan because it's not the owner occupier that is paying the mortgage ultimately. Yes, I know the mortgage payment is coming from the owner of said property. However, the serviceability of that loan is being paid for by the occupant, which is the tenant. So for that reason, the key difference between a residential loan and a buy to let loan um, is that lenders typically will look more at the property itself and the rentability of that property and the rental income that will be generated from that property. Whereas a residential mortgage which is a mortgage for a house that you live in yourself looks at you and your circumstances and how much income do you earn uh, which is different in a in a buyer to let um, what a lender would typically be looking for is that the rent covers the mortgage payment by more than a hundred percent and making it very simple for for those trying to understand if your mortgage payment is one thousand pounds and you will rent that property for £1,000, that's unlikely going to be sufficient to grant a mortgage on that property because if the tenant pays you £1,000 and your mortgage costs £1,000, that's a fairly poor investment, right? Because there's no cash flow. You know, you're making no profit on that property and you still have taxes to pay. You still have management fees. You still have maintenance costs. You still have upkeep and buildings insurance and all of these other incidentals to factor in. So what a lender would usually do in a buy to let loan application, which brokers like yourself will help people navigate, is they will make sure the rent covers the mortgage by typically 125%, sometimes a little bit more than that. So again, going back to the maths of thousand pounds is your mortgage. If the lender's assessment needs that to be 125% covered, your rent needs to be £1,250 because that's £125,000. Yeah. Um, so it, it's more a residential loan will stress the borrower and their income, their credit commitments, their liabilities. Can they afford the mortgage themselves? Whereas a buy to let loan looks more at the property itself, the rentability of that property and the rental income. Um, that, that property receives. Um, in terms of regulatory um, points, a residential mortgage uh, will be regulated by um, the FCA, whereas a buy to let loan um, typically are classed as um, unregulated, um, something that you can help uh, kind of guide and navigate um, the clients, um, clients on. 
Um, and, you know, hopefully you would agree with this point. I would say there are more intermediary only lenders in buy to let than there are in residential owner occupier. Usually um, you can go directly to a, a number of residential lenders, but there is still a quite a huge amount that require um, people like yourself to help gain access to that, that lender's product range in buy to let. Um, mortgage brokers are even more important because of the extra um, criteria, the nuances of using various lenders. And there are so many intermediary only lenders in buy to let because it is a little bit more complicated, uh, especially when you go into the realms of HMO lending, multi-unit freehold blocks, limited company buy to let. Um, people like yourselves are, are needed um, certainly more than ever. Yeah, absolutely. It's 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 it can be. It's sometimes a, a very complex space to be in, depending on the the lender you're dealing with and the and the intricacies of the client situation. And uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's it's become a, a bigger and bigger piece of of what the broker gets involved with. Um, and again, one more reason to use a broker because you know you're going to have that access, but also that knowledge around that field. Um, so when we're considering then those structures, when we're looking then at, I guess, buy to let mortgages in terms of pricing, uh, are all buy to let mortgages the same in that because i know we've touched on the fact that personal may be a little bit lower rate but obviously you've got to allow for the taxes you then got to pay whereas the limited company is a little bit more expensive but then potentially more tax efficient depending on your circumstance um i know there are hmo mortgages and multi-unit freehold block mortgages are they all the same as well or, or is that slightly different in terms of pricing so so usually and this is broadly speaking because some lenders will have just one product that covers you know all bases but broadly speaking depending on the class of property, there is going to be a difference in the pricing. So talking from our perspective, a standard buy to let, which would be on a normal house or normal flat to rent to a, an individual or a, you know, a, a family, a single family, um, is priced at a certain point. And then if you were to buy a property to use on a multi-let basis, so a student HMO or a professional HMO, for example, um, they are harder to manage. You know, there is more red tape, there is more regulation, there you know, they are more tricky typically than a vanilla standard house that you rent out to a sole individual or a small family. So for that reason, HMOs and multi-unit freehold blocks and all these other different products, holiday lets and expat mortgages, etc., typically will carry a higher rate. And again, that's just another reason why the individual needs to make sure that they are educated, right? And, and they make sure that they look at all of the factors at, um, at play. You know, if they are looking to explore holiday, holiday let mortgages because they think that's the thing that they should be doing, perhaps they live, um, you know, in a coastal location and they think it's prime for holiday lets. So for that reason, they want to invest in holiday let. They need to make sure they know the implications on mortgageability. What are the product choices for them? Not only that, but what are the tax implications for them? They might want to live in it in part themselves. They need to then look at, what the lender's criteria is re relating to how many days can they occupy the property versus rent that property out. Yeah. Um, a, a lot of the time there needs to be some thought on what their target uh, market needs to be. You know, it could be a HMO, could be a holiday let, could be a standard buy to let. And then they have the, the dream. They then go and explore the reality with their power team. And then they make the, the correct choices um, from there. But, you know, different products and different lenders will have different um, approaches and, and pricing strategies. But broadly speaking, they're all going to be different. Um, and outside of the obvious, you know, the interest rates and the fees on the product, legal costs always need to be um, a consideration. We we spoke earlier about a private, uh, privately owned buy to let usually broadly speaking here is going to be a lower rate than a limited company buy to let because there's less choice in the limited company world so for that reason they're usually a little more expensive but then the back end you've got the legal costs uh, are typically more expensive in a limited company and the same would go with um, a a multi-unit freehold block is effectively a building containing multiple properties that are rented out to individual people I would certainly expect the legal costs of buying a multi-unit freehold block will be greater than a, stand, a standard house. Yeah. Similarly, a leasehold flat is usually going to be more expensive on legal costs than a freehold house because a solicitor needs to read the full terms of the lease, report any concerns on that lease and repair any concerns with that lease as well. And usually a solicitor will charge a loading for that. So 
pricing will vary depending on many, many, many factors. And again, that's why the, uh, the landlord needs to engage with their professionals to, to get the whole well-rounded holistic advice before they push the button. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point, Alex. Um, really good point. Thanks for watching. And if you have any questions, please ask below and hit subscribe below so you don't miss out on our next episode.